September 11th, it's very important that we remember um, those things. So one way we can do that is if you are currently in the military, or if you were in the military, you're going to keep sitting, and the rest of us are going to stand up. So if you were not in the military, you stand. And if you are or were, you stay seated, because we want to honor you for what you've done and are doing. So let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you for these brave people who have um, put themselves in a position that their life could be on the line to protect us and our way of life. And so we thank you for that, Father. It's just a reality of life. And uh, we just pray a blessing on them and all the military that, that uh, do this for us. We honor them and thank them. Father, we remember those who were lost um, those 15 years ago and pray that good could come from it, Father. And we just ask that you help us to remember uh, in a way that honors the people who we lost, but also, Father, turns it into a good thing. In all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give our military a hand. <laughs> Thank you so much for your service. We are studying the commandments, and today is the fourth commandment, so let's read it. It comes from Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So God gave this commandment to the Jewish people thousands of years ago, and then he provided them details on how they were to keep the Sabbath. But how are we supposed to keep the Sabbath? What does it mean to us? How do we keep it today? One thing it means for sure is a rest from work. But what is our work? So today we want to answer that question first. What is our work that we are resting from? And next week we'll look at how we rest from that. Now our work is more than a profession. We usually think of work as whatever we do to earn a living, to pay the bills, to make sure that we have a roof over our heads. But it's more than that. It does include that, but it involves more than just that. Work is a gift. Did you ever think of it that way? When do you enjoy rest the most? After a, a hard, busy, productive day, right? Friday, I'm sure you guys, many of you work harder than me, so, but it just so happens Friday, I had a 15-hour day from the time I got up to go to work until I got home from work. Didn't mean I was working straight through 15 hours, but from the time I left to the time I got home was 15 hours. And what I did after that was very satisfying because of the work I did before it. But if I had a day of rest and then I rest, well, it's okay, but it is not nearly as satisfying. So work is a gift. So work we could describe as what we do, our contribution to the general welfare. We could describe it in that way. What we do to make the world better. Now, it says, it says in the scripture, God made the world in six days. And when he was done making it, he said it was very good. In other words, it was good as it was. So us making the world better doesn't mean we're improving on what God did. We can't do that. But God made the world with us in mind that we could contribute and be a part of the world. And so uh, maybe I can tell a story to kind of illustrate that. I'm the fifth of six children. And my little sister was born when I was about five years old. And when my mom was in the hospital giving birth to her, my dad was at home taking care of the five of us. And my dad came from the generation pretty much that if he was talking to you, you were probably getting yelled at, right? There wasn't a whole lot of positive interaction. 
But my mom's in the hospital giving birth to my sister, and my dad's taking care of us. He's got to feed us. So what did we have? We had pancakes with beer in them. <laughs> and so we're cooking these things together, right? And he's drinking a beer, and, and we're so excited. We never get to spend time with my dad like this. And he seems like he's having a good time. I don't know why I didn't do it more often. We had fun. He seemed to have fun. And he's drinking a beer, and then we're making beer batter together. And he has, I, don't know if, I think it was my sister, pour some of that in the pancakes. What? Beer in pancakes? Yeah, it's good that way. And so, I mean, to us, this was a really big deal. And my dad could have easily done it by himself much easier. But we did it all together. And it was fun. We enjoyed it. He involved us. And we interacted together. And together we made those beer pancakes. Um, I think the other thing he made was cream corn. Uh, we don't eat too much, but on the, on the main at the time, we ate it. And my sister got sick that night, and she's never eaten it since then. <laughs> so we always remember beer pancakes and corn with my dad. Now, from the beginning, um, from the very beginning, there's been a balance of work and rest. God made the world in six days. It says on the seventh day, he rested. Now, God didn't rest because he was tired. It just means that he was done with creation. He stopped creating. Um, but we see it's built into the world. I mean, there's the, the day is broken into daytime and night. Our bodies require sleep. God has built this rest into activity and rest. And so this Sabbath was at the very beginning. It's not something God gave to the Israelites when he gave the Ten Commandments. It was there from long before. It's just embedded into the world he made. And God is still working. God is still working to this day. And, and Christians, I just want you to know, Christians never retire. There's no such thing as a Christian who retires. And that doesn't mean that you can't retire from your job. It means that um, God's still working today. It says that um, Jesus said, my father's always working. And in the book of Hebrew, it says that God upholds his creation. God is the one that keeps it going. By his word, he didn't just make it and let it go. He's involved in it. He's upkeeping it. He's the one that maintains it. And so we never will run out of work, ever. Now, this is very important. As we talk about work, to understand this, that all of us have an ability to contribute to the general welfare. All of us do. And it's wrong if we have the ability to work and we don't. Paul, in writing to the, the Thessalonians, in the, uh, the letter to the Thessalonians, he said, hey, if there's people who are able but unwilling to work, they shouldn't eat. Don't feed them. If they can work and they refuse to work, they should not eat. So if we can contribute, it's right that we do contribute. But we have to acknowledge that we don't have equal ability to contribute. But our value doesn't come from that. So on a football team, they pay the quarterback more than the kicker. Why? Because the quarterback has more impact on the game than the kicker, right? So in the world, there is a value based on our ability to contribute. The better you can do it, the more you're going to get paid. But as far as God's concerned, if you and I, some of us are more talented than others, that doesn't make us more valuable if we contribute to whatever degree we can, then that's what we can do. So I work, I'm in, my field is special education. I go to classrooms with students who, they can't do anything for themselves. They cannot toilet themselves at all. There's people caring for them constantly every day. Their contribution, their ability to contribute is very, very small, but it is real. They're not less valuable because of that. God does not value them less, and we should neither. So Johnny Erickson Tata was, is a Christian lady, 18, dove into a, um, a shallow lake, broke her neck, and has been a paraplegic since then. She struggled with this. What is my contribution to the world? People have to come in every day. They have to take care of me. What am I contributing? And she came to the acceptance, the realization that she became an opportunity for them to serve. That's not what she wanted. She wanted to be an able-bodied person giving to others, but she realized that where she was at, she became an opportunity for people to care, just like these severely disabled children. 
they're an opportunity for people to care for them. So we are to contribute what we can, but our value is not based on how much we can. Because some of us can contribute more than others, but it doesn't mean we're worth more. Amen? So let's look at what is the work that God gives us to do. And to find that out, we're going to see what God says in Genesis chapter 1, 28. He's made the world and he's given an assignment to the people he has made. And this is what he says in Genesis 1, 28. It says, and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So in this scripture, we see the three things, the three jobs that God has given mankind to do. And the first one is to create. God says, be fruitful and multiply. Now God certainly meant by that that we are to procreate that we are to have children. And he means really to have a family. He doesn't mean just make babies, right? The family is God's design for raising children. And it doesn't mean that his intention is a, a man and a wife raising biological children. That's the way he intended. It isn't always that way. It doesn't mean that he can't bless broken families, but that was his intention. That's what it meant by this. But creation isn't only that. There's more to it than that. Now God creates people. He just allows us to be part of the process. Now, God gave them that direction. Then he gave Adam a specific task, it says in Genesis. And that task was to name all the animals. God made all the animals. He brought them to Adam, and Adam was to name them. And there's scholars that will say that's the beginning of science. That's where science began. Because Adam observed what God made, and he identified it, and he labeled it. And so science really, it's ironic that today science, some scientists try to say science is the basis for not believing in God. Science will tell us there is no God. And yet if there wasn't Christianity, there probably would be no modern science. That science today is based on Christian principles because Christianity says that the world was made. It was made with a purpose and it follows certain rules made by its creator and that we can observe those rules and we can record those rules, and then we can respond to those rules. We can um, do things based on those rules. We can discover things about the world, and we can act on them. So Christianity, really, one scientist said that science, modern science, is the child of Christianity. So let's see if we can make it a little more practical. Anybody here ever used GPS ever at all in your life? Okay, GPS is the result of this fella. Can you show that picture? I think I have it out of order. I think you know who this is, right? Albert Einstein. So Albert Einstein, <clears throat> Albert Einstein was a super smart guy, but he was maybe a little too smart for his own good because he didn't go to class and he talked down to his teachers and so he hurt his own career. And he ended up, he could have been a scientist, but nobody wanted to hire him. So he ended up working in the patent office as a clerk. But he continued to pursue science. And in 1905, he had what's called his miracle year. He had four papers published separately that year that changed the way the world looked at science. He just revolutionized the way we look at the world. And I'll be honest, I don't understand what he's talking about. So for me, <laughs> to try and explain it to you, would not do much good. But he did. He just, he totally revolutionized the way we looked at the world. It resulted in nuclear power, electromagnetic power, and GPS. That's all based on stuff that he discovered. And so he, he looked at the world and he observed it and he came to these conclusions that affect the life we live. So this is all what we are called to do, that God made a world with us in mind so we could interact with it. Amen? Now, the world is made of living things. And we, when we create, are meant to make the world a better place, that it's a better place to live, a happier, a more beautiful, a more comfortable place. Are we doing that? Is that how we're using our ability to create? And everybody, everybody here creates. We are all creators. 
If you bring something into existence that wasn't before, then you are a creator. If you fix a broken car, you're creating, you're solving a problem, that's creativity. If you teach a lesson with Children's Church, you're creating, you're teaching those kids. You came up with something that didn't exist before, that people made something for us to eat this morning, that's creativity. We're all creative, every one of us brings creativity into this world, that's one way that we image the, uh, God himself, we are made in his image, we have the ability to create. And some of us are more creative than others, but we are all creators, all of us. And so we need to create in a way that honors God and makes the world a better place. The second thing, task God has for us is that we are to care for creation. And so there's two things God said to do in regard to that. He said to subdue the earth and have dominion over it. And so when he said subdue, he meant bring it under control and to have dominion over it, to maintain your control. To su subdue means to bring the earth under your control and to have dominion over it is to maintain that control. And then this is easy to see. If you see a, a, a patch of ground that has just been left to grow on its own, it's wild. It has no order whatsoever, right? It's just going to grow. But we as humans have the ability to come in and control that, nurture it, make it more productive, more beautiful. The growth is what God does. We have the ability to control it and make it better. That's our job. Amen? And so Christians really, every Christian is meant to be a tree hugger. We're, we're meant to be environmentalists. We are meant to love and care about our environment. And, I mean, that doesn't happen a lot of times. We live in a culture that is all about consumerism. Cons our economy is based on consumerism. Buy, buy, buy. We are encouraged to buy what we can't afford. They, give us, they loan us money on credit to buy what we really can't afford. Why? Because that's the basis of our economy. And now, planned obsolescence, right? My mom has pans that she got. She was married over 50 years. She got pans when she's married. We're still using them today. How often does that happen in this world today? TVs last, what, a few years, right? And you've got to replace it. Why? Because they're not made to last. They're made so that you will continue to buy them year after year. Well, this is bad for the environment, and we can't totally change it. But we have to think about that kind of stuff. So there was just that big convention President Obama came to here in Hawaii, a huge, about, it's about the ecology and how can we take care of it. This earth is, is here to provide for us. It sustains us. And if we will take care of it and sustain it, it will provide for us for a long, long time. But if we abuse it, it's not going to be able to provide for us as it should. There's going to be 8 billion people in the world soon. That's never happened before. The earth can produce enough food for those people, but only if we take care of it. Christians have to be tree huggers. We have to think about these things. I remember years ago, there was a, a campaign that said, don't buy Thai, meaning don't buy products that were made in Thailand. Because Thailand had a policy that enabled children to be sexually abused. They're a poor country. And so people, because of their lax laws, people would go there and, and participate in, in sex with, with children. The government did little to stop it at that point because it brought money into the country. And so in, as a way to respond to that, they said, don't buy Thai. You can't go there and stop this, but we, our money has power. It speaks. When we buy something, it says a lot. We have power as consumers. Do we think about that? Where did this come from? Was it made under conditions, slave conditions? Was it made where, where we don't know where it came from or what the conditions people are living under? There's still slavery in this world. And we need to try to educate ourselves and think about that. We, I mean, in Kailua alone, we have so many options of where we can go to buy stuff. It's great to be a consumer because you can find whatever you want. You can find the cheapest form. But is that the only measurement we go by? And I understand economic reality. Money may be tight. That's why McDonald's dollar menu makes so much money. Uh, sometimes at work, I have time in between 
appointments. I, I go to McDonald's. They got free Wi-Fi, right? But they also have a dollar menu. It's filled with homeless people because the food is cheap. Maybe that's a decision they have to make, but are we in that position? Can we be more responsible? Can we care for them? Do we even think about that? That we are the caretakers of this earth and the choices we make, the things we buy, have an impact on that. Do we recycle? We got a blue bin. Is yours, does it even go out to the street? Or is it, ah, too humbug, I'm just gonna throw it in the regular rubbish, right? I mean, we are called to be caretakers of this earth. We are to subdue it, so it serves us better and to have dominion over it, to, to maintain that control. But we abuse it. I'm convinced, I, there's no doubt in my mind, there's a better way to power our, our factories and our cars than, than to burn fossil fuels. I'm not saying it's a bad way or that we should throw it out the window. I'm saying there's a better way that we could find a better way if only we would look. It's, it's out there, but right now we do that, why? Not because it's the best way, it's because a lot of people make a lot of money off of that way, and they're, they're against that system changing. I don't know if this is true, maybe you've heard this too, that some guy invented a, a car engine that gets well over 100 miles to the gallon, just a regular car engine, and the oil companies bought it, and through it, like, remember Raiders of the Lost Ark, the end of the movie, they stuck the ark in this warehouse, the oil companies took it and they threw it away because they didn't want it to be, I don't know if that's true, I'm just telling you that I wouldn't be surprised if it was true. But we are meant to be caretakers of the earth. Do we think about that? And the last thing is this, the last work is this, that we restore God's kingdom. So what God made was very good. But what God made very good got corrupted by sin. So in God's very good world, everything was properly related to everything else. People were properly related to God. People were properly related to their environment. But all that got thrown out of whack when sin came into the world. We were no longer properly related to God. Adam and Eve believed everything God said. It was the truth. It, they acted on it, and it was good. Until... <laughs> they started to think maybe God isn't telling the truth, right? And they thought, we know better than God. That threw everything out of whack. And God is trying to restore his creation. That's the work God's involved in now. He wants to restore everything back to the way it was supposed to be. Now, that's God's work. That is not ours. Only God can redeem the world. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus came to set everything right. And he finished that work. That's why in the cross, just before he died, he said, it is finished. The work of redemption is done. It cannot be added to. It's finished. It's complete. The war is over. God has won. His world will be redeemed. It will be restored. Now, World War II um, started in 1938, ended in May 1945. The war officially ended May 1945. The war was over, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't still work to do. Things had to still be corrected, set in place. It took years after that for the effects of the war to be fully felt by the places that had the war. Germany had to be reconstructed. It took years to do that. And Jesus has won the war to restore creation back to the way it was, but that doesn't mean there isn't still work to bring that redemption into reality. Amen? So, um, it's still ongoing, this work of redemption. You and I are involved in that. And it's restoring the right relationship. So what's the first thing that has to be redeemed? It's us. God has to redeem us as individuals to him. That's what it means to be born again. It means to become rightly related to God through Jesus Christ, through the work he did on the cross. That's what it means to become a, a Christian is now you are, before we were God's enemy, we did not know him, we did not love him, we did not seek to obey him, not really, not the real God, maybe a, a version of God that we want to believe in, but not the actual God. So to be a Christian is to be now rightly re related to God, to understand our dependence on him, that we are totally dependent on him and can't live without him. 
That's the way it was always supposed to be. So it starts with us. And now it's restoring that redemption, bringing that to the rest of the world. How do we do that? Well, part of that, a big part of that, is the Ten Commandments. That's the whole purpose of the Ten Commandments, to tell us how to rightly relate to God and to relate to other people. How are we treating other people? Do we love our neighbor as ourself? And remember, your neighbor, our neighbor, is anybody that we come into contact with. Anybody. If If we're a Christian then nothing happens by accident, nothing. And if somebody comes into our sphere of, of where we can interact with them, God put them there. Now that doesn't mean that we're supposed to um, get in everybody's face and tell them repent or go to hell. It doesn't mean that, but it means we're meant to be sensitive to what possibly could we be doing to bring redemption to that person And so our thinking should not be, when we come into a situation, what can I get out of it? That's not the way we're meant to think. We're meant to think, what can I do for the kingdom? How can I bring God's kingdom to reality on earth? So think about June Jones. June Jones was on the radio the other day. He's now a a coach at Kapolei High School. He's offensive coordinator at Kapolei High School. He's on the radio and saying, I'm in a unique position most people aren't in. I don't have to work. I can do whatever I want. I don't have to work. I have enough money to live on the rest of my life. Most of us are not in that position. But as Christians, we are. Because God says, all that's mine is yours. And someday, you'll experience the reality of that. In heaven, you, you don't have to worry about anything. It's all taken care of. You're okay. You're provided for. So we don't have to think about those things. June Jones doesn't have to think about getting a job to make a living. He's got all he needs. Well, as Christians, spiritually, God says, you have everything. You don't have to try so hard to provide for yourself. I'm going to take care of you. We can make God's kingdom our priority instead of meeting our own needs. Amen? So hopefully that gives us a clear idea of of what our work is and puts it in perspective so that we can now look next week at what does it mean to rest from that work, to take a Sabbath from that work. Amen? Okay, well, let's pray. Please bow your heads. Father, thank you for all of us have some measured ability to contribute to the general welfare. And I just pray, Father, that you could help each of us see that opportunity and take advantage of it. Father, that we are not just takers, but we are contributors as well. And Father, help us to think carefully about our work. Father, of how we can create for the good of others and how we can care for what's already created to make it better and more productive. And Father, help us to see how we can work to bring your kingdom here on earth. In all these things, Father, we thank you and praise you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. So we are, I want to encourage that if you haven't, if you're interested still in reading the book seven, some of us are participating in that. It's helping us examine our own life in ways that perhaps we are off track in practicing our Christianity. Do we have any copies left in the back, Kenneth? Yes? It's only five bucks and the book is brand new and it doesn't cost five bucks, but it costs you five bucks. So I just encourage you to partake of that. And the last thing I want to do before um, Cardin comes up and, and shares some information is two things. One, if you're a man, a male, I want to 